I'm in the Conquer Kyla Regional School Committee meeting to order. Um, let's do a roll call for uh, attendance. Uh, Booth. Present. Boat. Present. Uh, Cynthia. Randy here. Wilson. Here. Mustafi. Mustafi here. Johnston here, and uh, we'll note that Alexa's with us too. Okay. Um, first up would be public comment. If anybody has a comment, you could just raise your hand on Zoom. That would be ideal. Don't see anything. We're on one page still. I don't see um, any. So, chairs and liaison reports. Um, I don't have anything. You've seen what I've seen as far as school committee stuff goes. It's all been right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not much since the last three days. I would just say thanks to the community for the kind of feedback and, and input that we've gotten. We'll get to correspondence in a minute, but thanks for that's all on the, the planning process for fall. Uh, any yeah. liaison report from other committees? Do we have anything from... I think we'll uh, reference FinCom when we move to correspondence. Yes. Yep. Which uh, we'll move back to now. I haven't taken it out of order. Uh, no, that was right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. We did. All right. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. Yep. I tallied them up. So, correspondence, we've had a few more emails even since Monday. Uh, we had two more regarding anti-racism. We had eight emails that were um, either comments or questions regarding the, the plan to reopen. And we've had, and we had the two emails, basically one to each committee from the finance committee starting to plan for our FY22 budget. <laughs> As if we weren't still in the midst of 21 again. Um, but they reached out to us to start to plan uh, the guidelines discussions uh, in October for the FY22 budget. So we are grateful for that and coordinating with them and we'll start that process um, pretty soon actually. <laughs> and I think that was it, unless you saw anything else, Wally, that I missed mentioning. You got it all. I, I wonder if I'm, I might oh, have- Oh, the you. one, whoops. Sorry, go ahead, Court. Yeah, I, I'd like to spend another minute or two minutes on the uh, the anti-racism policy work and curriculum work uh, recommendations that are coming our way because uh, the recommendations or uh, the appeal or demands put before the school committee um, uh, from a number of people now are pretty consistent. And I, I'd like to just call out that uh, the the appeal we're hearing is uh, for a curriculum that uh, embraces more anti-racism subjects, more uh, uh, historical context around uh, origins of racism, uh, uh, the value of an equity audit in the school district, uh, and uh, the uh, examination of inputs and uh, where we're where we're getting information from in terms of uh, students and families that uh, inform us uh, and that uh, teacher training reflect uh, uh, a need for uh, anti-racism understanding and efficacy uh, and uh, uh, that uh, generally equity issues around uh, students of color and uh, other marginalized uh, persons and uh, uh, be, be examined uh, and acted upon. So I just wanted to, I, I don't want to read the, the letter, but uh, simply uh, put it on, on the record that uh, we, we're hearing this. Um, we know it's an impassioned, thoughtful appeal and uh, there's a lot of detail to it, and it's gonna take uh, a lot of careful attention and uh, commitment on our part. And so we know that. Definitely. I think it's also worth pointing out, as Laurie has mentioned, that there's been a lot of collaboration 
um, with many of the people or the groups sending this as well. And so it, it is definitely a joint mission to make a lot of these improvements. And that's something that we're committed to as well. Thank you. Um, the only other comment I was gonna pull out of those emails I mentioned is that one of them was um, an offer of help you know, on things like making masks and shields and that kind of stuff. And we have heard that several times from the community. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and reference that boy, we appreciate those offers so much and, and we'll engage when the time is right to, tr to coordinate those. So much appreciated. And we um, will certainly take our community up on the, the willingness to help out here. Uh, and I think that was it for correspondence, so. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And I, I do want to make, uh, just make note, we have been very actively involved in cultural competency and, and uh, attempting to work on issues we know exist um, for some time. Uh, it's uh, always helpful to have input from, from people and especially recent students, which most of that is. Um, and uh, there's a long way to go here and elsewhere. So, thank you. Um, Anything so else? Uh, no, uh, please, just, as, a, as a segue, our, uh, as we move on, our METCO director, Mr. Uh, Namichi, was uh, uh, heralded today uh, in the METCO newsletter for his uh, singular efforts around pulling together conversations uh, uh, that are, I believe, statewide uh, that are bringing um, METCO students uh, and other students of color uh, together for dialogue uh, that is in, in the METCO uh, uh, Inc.'s opinion, uh, a, a real you know, hallmark of, of uh, what's, what's possible and a standard setter for what should be happening by way of community dialogue that just came out today. So thank you, Mr. Namichi. Yes. Thanks. Um, so, superintendent's report. Thank you. I just had a couple of updates since clearly we'll be doing others as we go through the agenda. Um, yesterday, I met with the Board of Health officials in town and all of the private school headmasters. Uh, so, we're just trying to come into all of this reopening of school with a baseline of common common approach, common understanding of the protocols, common understanding of the roles between the Board of Health, Health Officials and the schools, clearly a community of partnership and collaboration supporting one another. So that, that was a really positive meeting and um, that's on top of the ongoing con, con, um, conversations I'm having with the Board of Health Officials. So um, that, that was just a nice, nice discussion with my colleagues and to have a, a local based approach um, that's consistent to, to whatever extent's appropriate in each of the different environments. Um, so that's one update. I just also wanted to remind you we are at the finance committee on Tuesday night of next week. I know you mentioned the FY22 memo that we received. We are actually talking with them about FY21 on Tuesday night. So Jared and I will attend that. We do meet Monday, so we'll mention it again next week, but um, that is to, and immediately gonna follow your discussions next week and kind of be in the middle of those as you've got a budget workshop also later in the week. So um, we're looking forward to talking with them and hearing with what the approach is gonna be to try to finalize the budgets as we get closer to town meeting. Do you remind the, the time on that? Seven o'clock. I'm pretty sure it's seven o'clock. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, early retirement incentive. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to start? Do you want to? Yeah. Why don't you kick it off? And okay. I'll just quickly frame it, uh, in, especially since we have a couple of new members. Um, in 2017, 
we were in uh, need of some budget relief. Um, and so we did some work to study different options, creative options outside of the normal budget process. One of those options was to, to offer a, an early retirement incentive to um, staff who had 15 years in the district. Um, and the rationale behind that is they're at the top of the salary schedule. And we benchmarked a master's step seven um, entry point for their replacements for a delta of an annual savings of over $40,000. Um, the incentive was to be paid out over three years for the total of 40,000. And what it allowed every year was significant savings that compounds as it goes. Um, so if you look at the memo that's attached to the agenda, you can see that over time we've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the folks who participated in this program. Um, so it was a win in terms of the finances, but equally as important to us was that this was meant to be a positive, um, positive project in collaboration with the teachers. And those who participated, participated because it felt good to them and it just was successful on both fronts. We had brought it back, uh, I guess a little over a month ago, probably April-ish, May, um, to suggest we might revisit this. Um, and as we were rebuilding FY21, thought it could offer some cost savings. We asked the teacher unions to survey their membership and um, had a moderate, res low response for this one, a moderate response Last time we had done it in two phases for one fiscal year and then a deadline a few months out for the secondary fiscal year. And it seemed that there was more interest in the FY22 timeframe than there was in the FY21 timeframe. Well, so as the summer's going on here and we're really getting to the planning process of how we're gonna open the schools, there's also individual plans being made and situations being reflected upon and uh, people, frankly, just really having that struggle of their own health and their family safety and uh, other variables. So uh, it was suggested that we might look to revisit this. It does sound like there are people who um, might be interested in partaking immediately. And that would be my recommendation that it would be at a, a short term invitation. We should look at it again for FY22, but that should be part of the FY22 building project process, not something I think we just automatically roll full forward. Um, I guess I'll frame all of this also in a really challenging time of managing um, just all of the pieces of op reopening school. Yes, all the work that we did to roll out to you, but just in, in, the, in the regard of individual staff members, we're we're supporting people, like I said, with medical and family medical, but also childcare needs. And there's a lot of moving pieces right now. So this I think could be beneficial to put one more option on the table for um, those who are eligible to consider. And so I thought we'd bring it back to you for discussion. Um, again, I'd be suggesting that if we did this, it would be a very immediate, process in August with a short turnaround and a one-time event for FY21 that would close. Um, and then we can decide later if FY22 is something we want to look at or not. So that's, we had left it that we'd bring it back for 22. I am bringing it back earlier than I had originally thought. So that's, I think, where we're at. We're, I can answer more questions. Jared could run all the numbers, but I think you've got them in front of you. That it, in terms of the savings. Well, and just to s summarize and make sure I understand and everybody else does, the benefits of doing this are twofold. One is that it lets some teachers step out of this situation where they're uncomfortable anyway, without having to, you know, figure out leave or things like that. And and then for financially, it means that we are letting them retire, not continuing to pay them, and also not in some cases, paying leave on top of it. Yeah, thank you for clarifying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so just to clarify, we would pay them something. We just wouldn't be paying them their salary. In some cases, 
Yes, <clears throat> depending um, on their situation. Yeah, I guess the uh, sort of thing that jumps out first is uh, in the, assuming we need to replace them uh, in a late date. I, I suspect given what's going on around the state that replacing is probably feasible. I, I, believe, I believe so, yes. Yeah. And we're gonna replace them. In some cases, we're replacing people either way. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Laurie, yeah. when, we, when we look at the memo uh, for CPS, for example, we see on 630 2020, uh, nine FTEs uh, uh, participated. Uh, is that accurate? Yes, so there were two phases last time. Uh, all, this, if I might, this all originated in 2017, so it's just still playing out now. Yes. Got it, thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. And this would be a one year and it would uh, impact uh, teachers who have already commenced into fiscal 21 uh, uh, salary receipts, but uh, that would simply be adjusted and would be a, a simple bookkeeping matter, I assume. Correct. Yeah, okay. So, and actually, just clarity um, most teachers who get paid through the summer, it's FY20 pay. The FY21 pay starts the first of the school year. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, so just an initial thought to, in terms of framing, I know we looked at this several months ago and decided not to do it. Um, that was without a pandemic, of course. The, the reasoning at that point was both level of interest. We didn't have a huge level of interest, primarily. Yeah, we, we were in the pandemic, but it was the level of interest for FY21 that right. made us rethink it. Um, that's, that's changed, which is why I'm bringing that back. Right, okay. So, so that has primarily changed. The other factor that we've talked about in the past, and I don't think this is as relevant, but just put it out there, with a few years, we didn't want to do it necessarily. We decided not to do it again right after we had offered it so that it didn't seem to become a yearly thing, right. which we have said we certainly don't want to create. So my initial take is that those concerns, both on um, interest and making it a what seem like a yearly process are are not concerns right now because there now is interest and it wouldn't be have been yearly we've skipped years already mm -hmm. um so my only question would be are there any other downsides we're not discussing yet because otherwise it seems like a pretty good idea um i don't i don't see immediate downsides i think the concern over the yearly piece I, I do know there was interest in 22, so I don't know how that'll play out. But I, I honestly, I'm so in the moment here. I don't know that that would be my biggest concern. We can tackle that in the coming months as we go forward. We can, and I would also say we're in a pandemic, so nothing gets yeah <laughs> as automatically a yearly thing. If you think. right, yeah, yeah. To your question, Heather, I think normally we might hear the the concern. Why didn't you tell us earlier? But in fact, we did, and so this is a right. this yeah. is a renewed attempt. I think the uh, conversation today, assuming that we are very favorably inclined, and this is. Uh, uh, another way of supporting teachers the way they would want to be supported right now. Uh, the question might be, what is the, uh, the responsible incentive figure to put in front of teachers? I know that, uh, uh, what, three years ago, we had a $40,000 number. That was uh, a bit more generous than most uh, comparable school districts were uh, providing when they were putting together similar uh, offerings. Um, do you have a recommendation there, Lori, or do you want to uh, push that our way? I, I, I think i mostly let you dialogue on that. I would just, you know, give you the history of where that number came from. Um, it really was a result of doing the math, and partly the reason that number's high is because our whole salary schedule tends to run higher than most other districts, so we can we can bring in a teacher with less experience and still save money, even with that kind of a, an incentive attached. So 
some of it's just the relativity to our salary scale, which is why we landed there. Um, but I think that is up for some, you know, that's for your dialogue here today. If you want to revisit that, I just want it for simplicity. I brought you what we've done in the past. And, uh, and I think this wouldn't influence my decision ultimately, but I think we ought to pause for a, a moment and note that, uh, uh, this could incentivize some of our best and brightest, and uh, we cherish our best and brightest. I guess the one thing I would say, yes, that could be true, but um, given the medical things that I no. am aware of, uh, that's the case anyway. Yeah. So, and a number of them are going to be eligible for very extensive sick leave, and I worry financially a bit on that side of it, so. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, I'm not begrudging that. Make 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 sure I say that out loud. But just sure. trying to strategize the finances while we meet the needs of the people is is part of the goal. Uh, so I, I I would offer up my opinion, and that is that uh, this is a responsible and necessary move on our part. Sorry, can I just ask if? Um, uh, have we looked at uh, numbers uh, that other districts are uh, proposing right now in this uh, current situation of the pandemic and um, budgetary limitations? I've looked at um, uh, a few few schools and um, the number is uh, not 40,000. Um, right. What is the percentage um, of that incentive? Uh, uh, how does, what is the percentage of this incentive, um, the way it would relate to the uh, earnings of the the salary of the teachers is it ten percent eight percent five percent two percent what's what's the I don't know if I would try to do the math off the top of my head um, they're paid out in installments over three years so each year they get about thirteen thousand dollars which is partly how the budget um, pays that out but we save more than that every year so we come out in the positive. Um, the average high end of the salary schedule is about 116,000, I'd say. And the salary of the person we would look to replace them with would be 75, 76,000. So I've seen um, uh, from the uh, short research I've been doing um, on districts, um, retirement incentives, I've seen some districts proposing 8%. Um, on, the, on that higher end, um, if they were um, offering incentives, 8% uh, of the salary. And so that would, um, would that be, most of the teachers would be in that 170 um, landscape there or? So these are all teachers at the top of the scale. So um, this number, again, I, I don't have all the numbers and I don't want to be doing numbers while I'm trying to speak with you at the same time. Again, this number was a result over three years, almost three years ago of the work we did to look at the differential of savings. And because the salary numbers are so you know generous that the savings is generous also. So it is, it is higher than other districts. I will not at all try to couch that. Um, I'm gonna cuff it at about 11%, 10 to 11. Okay. <coughs> I think I'd look at it a little differently. Um, the kind of conversation about the number relative to salary and relative to other districts uh, is a very good one to have for 22. Um, I think given what we're trying to accomplish with this right now, um, both with the speed with which it would take place um, and the reason for doing it, uh, the benefit to us is actually going to be a little greater than it has in the, in the normal circumstance. Um, I would hesitate to adjust downward um, the dollar amount over what, our, what this most recent historical early retirement incentive was. Um, I, think we, uh, I think we could hurt our prospects. If we did that, I don't really see it. I don't see it. I don't see a strong reason to do that. We had the same sort of discrepancy in our last uh, projections and 
and decided to go with these numbers. Um, and uh, like I said, this is not strictly about uh, saving, you know, a certain amount of money on the budget work. This is likely going to happen anyway. <laughs> so it's, uh, in fact, could be a significant improvement for us. I don't know if that, I don't want to get too detailed into that for some obvious reasons, but um, I do think it's, I do think it's important that if there are people who uh, find this attractive, uh, that we, we try to exercise it. Well, if, if we had the benefit of time, which we don't, I, I would want exercises like looking at 40,000 over a four year payout and probably a couple of other permutations, but yeah. I, I'm with you now, now's not the time. Yeah. And you might do that for 22. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think it, I do think it makes total sense to wait on a 22 incentive because you'll have a lot more information by time you're considering that mm -hmm. uh, in the late fall, early winter. So uh, I know chairs uh, want to close this conversation properly. I don't want to preempt it, but uh, uh, what happens from here if, uh, if we are to move ahead? Do we uh, uh, make it formal on Monday, Wally and Heather? Yeah, I think that would be the right approach, mm -hmm. unless somebody uh, was firstly felt they needed more time to consider it. Mm -hmm. um, Plan for a vote Monday. Yeah, because we want to get this underway for obvious reasons. Yep. And I fully support this uh, program. Uh, Lori, do you anticipate a sometime in August deadline? Or is this, you're going to, yes. oh, definitely. You're not going to just keep it open? No. <laughs> I might be a quickest turnaround program you've ever seen in a couple of days, a week to just to, well, but that's to, to be expected in this environment. So we meet on the third, the seventh looks like a good day. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so to that point, uh, sometimes these programs uh, uh, don't uh, take because there's a minimum threshold a district wants to arrive at before they launch a program like this. Uh, are we concerned at all about the opposite, that we uh, should cap this in some way? I am not right now because I did the time with the uh, CTA and CCTA before I would bring it to you. They've, the CTA has done a soft survey and um, seemed like it was three to five people interested. Um, C C T A. It may be less than that, so I don't think we're going to get overwhelmed. So if those numbers doubled, it it wouldn't uh, dismay us or throw us into financial upheaval. No. No, or personnel upheaval. Okay, thank you. We're we're already in some personnel. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't need to, you know, hopefully it's going to just be one person at a time we settle it, but there, every district right now with all these unknowns and moving pieces, it's really a lot to set, stable, uh, stable for the open school we will be, I'm sure. I, I wish upheaval was uh, something that we were avoiding right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it'll be, yeah. it'll be fine. I think this just gives us another tool in the toolkit here, which is, helpful. Good. So between now and Monday, if anybody has any other questions, just reach out to either Wally or me or Lori and, and we'll plan to wrap this up on Monday. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's move on to the calendar. Yeah. Okay, so and Cynthia can chime in along the way here. We met again yesterday with the calendar committee, which is formed based on the contractual um, representation. So we were reflecting on the commissioner's uh, directive that we could uh, consider 170 school days instead of 180. So we went back to what we had brought to you earlier in the week and did some, um, a lot of really great conversation and some creative thinking. We came up with a kind of a 
I feel like it's a very comfortable approach. It gives us time on the one end for onboarding staff and all the training and protocols we need to do with them. And then it brings kids back in a, in a little bit of a virtual way first and then builds to the in-person over a few days time. So I will just do a quick overview of what we had um, suggested. We would be looking at professional days. Oh, let me, let me back all this up by saying we really only looked at September and October with a little bit of high level look for the rest of the year. Um, the committee felt that to try to try to really look at where other days are going to fall with so much uncertainty and wanted to get the year up and running and be sure we had a little more information to work with. So the committee will need to reconvene in, um, in September to talk on what we think November beyond. I think the high level would be committing to the vacations, maintaining themselves and an end of school date of June 16th. We know with the 10 day reduction, that's really comfortable. Um, and indeed the commissioner finally said, what I've been saying to you is snow days are not, snow days are gonna be virtual days going forward. So that, you know, that really solidifies the end of the year. Um, so we really focused in on the startup of school and some thought about what October might be benefit, what, what might benefit us in October. So September, August 27th through September 3rd, we'd be onboarding staff and doing training and protocols and professional development. On Tuesday, September 8th, um, students would receive a virtual school day that would include getting to know you, orientations of especially the transition grades, welcome back, they'd certainly um, Zoom with their each class likely and get to see each other that way. Um, we actually liked that idea in many ways because it builds whole class feeling to start the year in <coughs> the middle and high school where those kids won't physically be together for any t foreseeable time. Um, Wednesday the 9th, if we assumed it would be an early release half day as we proposed earlier this week that all Wednesdays would be, um, we would bring K to five in for the half day and have six through 12 have a virtual day. And part of the thinking there with the hybrid schedule to start six through 12 on a half day Wednesday is not a great start. So it made sense to get, do a little more virtual with them on Wednesday and then start the rotation on Thursday. And then everyone's in. Um, beginning with the hybrid schedules as they are outlined on Thursday the 10th. So we haven't used all 10 of the days, uh, which gives us more flexibility going forward during the year, which the committee thought was very beneficial. We did suggest uh, a professional day on October 13th to be attached to the three-day weekend, which is not in your memo, but I would like to ask you to consider renaming that at the committee's recommendation to Indigenous Peoples Day, and we will list it that way on the calendar. So that's what the committee's bringing to you with the big picture view of expecting other things to stay stable in terms of vacations and end of school date and a plan to return to the calendar in early September, um, and a reminder of the Wednesday half days. So it's gonna be a work in progress that I think fits the fact that everything is a bit of a work in progress, but I think it sets a nice ramp up to the year and give us a chance to do everything we need to do with teachers before we're live with kids. Our thanks to the committee for this. Uh, Laurie, uh, the uh, 170 days refers to student learning. The uh, teacher days remain 185. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, in terms of the 170, if I'm counting correctly, since the only compared to what it used to be, um, if the kids would have started the 31st. That week that the, is now professional development, the 31st through the third. I'm jumping between screens here, calendars and <laughs> documents, is four days of extra professional development and then the one extra in October. So am I correct 
that so far this schedule uses five of the 10 extra days we have and we have five left to work with still? Well, uh, so typically we actually have five already because the teachers work 185 days out of 180. Right. So we actually now have 15 to work with. Total. If you follow. Right. Yeah. So, if you, we so would, that would count it as of the 27th. So, right. So you're, you'd have the 27th through the third. So all of those days, the 13th, and then you'd still have all of the remaining to follow. Yeah. So it's actually more than that. Okay. Got it. So it's six in uh, August, September, and then right. one in October, seven. And then, we, so we actually have then eight to work yeah. with still. Yes. And some of those are the typical conference days we're going to look at. And the, there's always a PD day in January for the upper grade. So all of those normal things will be part of the discussion. So those will equal, usually those are three days in and of themselves. And then we'll look at how we spread the other remaining ones. Okay. So we have, of the extras, we basically do have five left of the right. extras to work with. Got it. Okay, good. Thank you. And the thinking was that now that we have some uh, dates regarding the start date, we need, especially CCHS administration, to go back and set up their calendar so we know the semester end and the quarter ends and exams and all those sorts of things. And then we could drop in at least the high school, have a better idea about how to set up the conference days, et cetera. And even at K-8, they still want to go back and sort of strategize and where to put the conference days, so. Um, that makes sense. Um, I'll just say, I know this would be your plan anyway, but I'm going to say it out loud that parents will need um, good notice in order to plan for those professional days when the kids are not only not in school, although that can happen a lot, but not doing remote. So I know you'll do that anyway, but just saying out loud that we want to make sure we give parents as much notice as possible as we schedule those. Yeah, and I, I, I will say that comes with all these other moving pieces that, you know, in this year, notice is just a different sense to it yeah. than what we would normally have. And um, yeah. unfortunately, that's just where we are. Where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, in my opinion, I think I said this to the committee, I would rather kind of go slow Mm -hmm. and set out a calendar that continues to change again and again because yeah. then they probably have settled and we're undoing stuff and it, this will we will roll this out saying this is September and October so far in September we will do November December and as far out as we possibly can mm -hmm. uh, yeah makes sense can I ask a quick question on the calendar? I've been getting a lot of questions and I just don't know how to answer it. What was the sort of thinking behind the half day Wednesdays? I just don't know sort of the oh, background. Sure. How yep. that um, we, we know we're going to need, let, let me start with the elementaries have always had that. It's just been on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking six through 12. Yeah, because of the hybrid split, because it's Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday. So doing it in the middle of the week keeps everything nice and balanced and teachers have been working. Oh, no, I just mean the half day period. Why the- That's for time for teachers because we are starting everything in a new way. We know we're gonna need to continually have department meetings and team meetings of teams of teachers. Got it. Training, technology training, social emotional training, cultural competency and anti-racism is on that list. And it's, everything's new. So, right. cool. yeah. No, I'm glad you asked. We can clarify that when we send this out, so. The only big change is for the high school. The middle and elementary have always had a day a week with a less than full schedule, so. Not much, nearly enough, I mean, you know, just. Yeah, I, it's, it's gonna get full quickly, yes. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if the kids find it beneficial too. Um, especially the ones that would have had three full days of uh, remote learning on that week. Right. Any other uh, comments? Yeah, I'll just clarify, Wally. The high school kids will have remote learning asynchronous, but they will have remote learning on Wednesday afternoons or we will not make the time and learning requirement from the state. Sorry to add, Faith. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's why I clarified. <laughs> and oh, and that's Wrong. just just at the high school. Um, I no, that isn't just at the high school. It's the nine nine the nine ninety that's now down to nine thirty five. I think is a, a number we need at the high school. The others we don't need it for time on learning. We're still working through those schedules, um, but it does look like the others might even have some synchronous things. So we're still sorting it all out. What we needed was the teachers available half the day for professional developments. Right. We're still working okay. on the student side of it. So from a student's perspective, it won't always be a half Wednesday. Probably not. Okay, it, that's good. I think that's something we should clarify in our outward communications because I yes. think. That's but the afternoon will be remote engagement, not in right. person. Right. right. Okay. Right. So that's good. I'll put all that in the communication when we share the yeah. change. Good. That's helpful. That's great. Yep. Yep. Again, we'll vote on this on uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. um, assume these two things are on the, the uh, posted agenda. Well, I had this dilemma of having a post before we had this meeting. I think the calendar is we'll be sure the retirement incentive gets added. Erin's on this meeting, so she's probably already doing it while we talk. Okay. Good. Which would uh, put us under the window anyway. And we're just adding, so that's okay. Um, as long as everybody here is okay. Yes. So, um, so we're finished to that discussion. Yes. Uh, let's move on to reopening plans. Yeah, I thought, um, I think the intent of this agenda is really for, mostly for you to all dialogue and ask questions. Just a few highlights from our end. Um, again, reminder of the purpose of what we've proposed is that uh, it's trying to really strike the balance between maximizing in-person learning while achieving safety measures and protocols that uh, through all the committee work we deemed necessary. Um, trying to also balance the time in school, the time out of school in a way that didn't allow for big gaps of time for kids to be away from the school building and live instruction. Um, at the elementary level, we really focused on bringing all kids in five days a week because of the challenges of remote learning. I know there's been questions about the half day there as well. So I'll just, you know, give a little more of that rationale more clearly. Um, to be able to cohort the elementary kids is what's really allowing the, all of them to come back rather than going to the hybrid alternating mode. However, by bringing them all back, when you then start to look at the more complicated settings of lunch, recess as we didn't know it at all, or certainly as we used to know it, um, the specialists when they're, even if the specialists are coming to them, um, which we debated, there's big differences in who's exposed to each other. It starts to shift the cohort feeling considerably. Um, so all of that added up to essentially not meeting the safety mandates we were setting for ourselves. So we, essentially got to two choices. We could either go the hybrid split day with the elementary and they had full days of remote learning, or we could bring them all in and do the early release every day. So we've recommended the half day early release because every student's in school every day. And that felt most beneficial for the kids. Built some really nice routines, hopefully for the youngest students and set a really predictable plan for families knowing Knowing that no matter what we did, we were creating a child care issue, but hopefully the most stable was managing the afternoon piece. So that's a little background on that that I know has come up. The one other thing that I know we've all had feedback on, and I think some feedback's gone to you as well, um, is the question of the alphabetical split at the high school and you know the challenge of kids not being with friends and that's just a consistent piece we've heard from the kids directly. We're hearing from their families. Um, it was on Mr. Mastrullo's task force this morning and we talked some on it. Um, he's considering um, some options to see if we can even do some data gathering to see what other things we can come up with. But we do know that structure is the best structure for all the safety measures we need to achieve. 
I guess I might as well explain this too while I'm explaining things. If you bring them in by grade level, which is what seem, you know, of course you have more of your friends in your grade level, you bring them in by grade level, the natural split in the class size that we get when we go alphabetical disappears. So then you've got a group of ninth graders in English who are all at school. And now we're then taking half of them and having to remotely teach them in the building or put a tutor with them while they're teachers with the other half. Definitely not exactly what we would have envisioned for academics. And then the trick there is if you've got like nine, 10 in the building, our plans and hopes for some zooming in evaporate because the 11th and 12th graders don't have any classes going on to zoom into. So it just doesn't work the same way. And we had also hoped to keep families together. And the only way to do that is alphabetically. So we are still seeing what we can come up with, committing to alternative and creative options where kids can be together. Um, we know it's, it's definitely a pressure point for the kids and we're glad they felt comfortable saying that. And I have talked to all the local, dis talked to all the local districts around us, hoping somebody else had figured out another way and everybody's gone alphabetical. So, so I'm just gonna open with those pieces that seemed like they were the two biggest pieces of feedback. I have had a lot of positives too, so I shouldn't forget to add that. Um, and then turn the conversation over to you. Um, I think just as far as framing this goes a little, um, obviously we haven't had a lot of time since this was presented to us on Monday, um, but uh, we would like to vote it on Monday. Um, and uh, so if there are things that you have been, uh, either would like more information about it and wondering about, or uh, might have issue with. Uh, I think it would be beneficial to us to uh, treat this as if we were, you know, we had made a motion and we were now discussing prior to voting. We'll do that again Monday uh, for sure, but uh, let's surface anything that uh, might be on your minds now um, so that if there is anything uh, that we feel needs to be adjusted prior to, if got a little time, very little, to uh, do something about it prior to us hoping to take a vote on Monday. Wally, I, I, thank you. I could offer up a, a couple of comments. Uh, one is, uh, I don't think anybody's happy, but I don't think that was the goal either. Uh, we knew this was going to be a, a very painful uh, balance of uh, needs and issues. Um, my early read is that uh, what the superintendent uh, shared on Monday shocked nobody. Uh, and that's good news. Mm -hmm. That's good news. Uh, and then finally, what I'd say is that there has been a, a hope, sort of a latent hope on the part of some people in the district and expressed by a few. Uh, we've got such an except, exceptional school district and such talented folks uh, leading it and teaching in our classrooms. Uh, can't we uh, leverage all our, our innovative uh, talents and our creative capacities and do something different? Uh, and uh, sadly, I think the answer is no, uh, because uh, every school districts, uh, Concord Carlisle and, and others, uh, are dealing with the same external realities. Uh, so as much as we'd like to say uh, that we've got something novel, um, uh, no pun intended, that would be a very bad pun, uh, um, we, we simply don't because our, our realities are so similar to, to that that everybody else is experiencing. Anybody else got uh, comments, questions? So I don't, uh, I don't see this as voting for the plan because this is, as Lori says, it's a roadmap. It's a general set of, we're gonna try to do these things, these three different options in this, these ways. Um, and I know that a lot of things are going to change as we get more information, um, not, you know, change in a big way, but uh, I think the very details about um, how we're going to do, bring back uh, the hybrid model or the remote model or 
I don't, as we discussed, we don't think it's possible to bring everybody back at six through 12. So um, I don't perceive my vote as, this is, we're locking into this plan. We're, we're locking into an approach, which is gonna change um, uh, as it should. And uh, so I appreciate all the work and all the level, the, uh, level of detail that's gone into this. And I think it's uh, something that's going to require a lot more work going forward. So thank you. Thanks. I also wanted to comment on the, on the plan. Um, I appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness and all the heavy lifting in, uh, in this planning process. You can't make everybody and you can't meet everybody's needs, unfortunately. Uh, there is no good uh, there is no great plan there is no good plan there is a plan um that is feasible um when it comes to uh ensuring everybody's safety and um providing uh the education for for our students the best we can and that's uh, that social emotional piece uh just wanted to um uh, say that um uh that day um the, the virtual day uh, that uh, the high school teachers will be speaking to our students and families um, about um, a return to school is uh, such a great idea. I, I uh, when I saw that um, uh, 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 when I saw that on this on the schedule, I, I I was really happy to see that because um, I I've seen the impact of those uh, virtual webinars that. Um, uh, personally, when we were going through um, uh, the college visits, um, it is it brings uh, some normalcy and some understanding of what to expect, which um, we can all expect that anxieties are high and, and students are really interested in knowing um, where they're going and uh, what is going to happen to them and, and then parents are uh, on the same boat with them. So I really appreciate all the great ideas that are um, uh, being put forward um, by the uh, school administration and and teacher. Um, and um, yep, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. I think um, I've heard a lot of great feedback about how detailed and thought out and um, you know, while it's not what everybody wants, it's um, it it gets it gets us somewhere that um, that people feel they know where they're going, which I think is a really good position to be in. Are there any like known unknowns at this point for the that that, that could change anything between now and and Monday? I know that there's all sorts of stuff that's always changing, and we kind of know what we know is always going to change. But is there are there any concerns that you have, Lori, about? Um, some piece that's not quite exactly where where it should be to make this you know the, we've already this week made a very significant shift into the next layer of detail which has actually felt really good so we're really pinning down the schedule the details of the schedules for all the levels um honing in on travel and how kids are going to switch classes like we're getting into the next layer which actually feels really good. And so long as the schedules, I've been on the meetings all day continuing that progress. I think we're in a good place to finish that up by next week. Cause really, you know, each piece, we had to build the big picture structure, which is what went out. Now we're building the next layer of structure. And then there's this other layer that follows that. So I think we're, we're doing, do we're doing well. Um, I have to, this, the timeline we laid out has been completely on track all summer long. So barring something that we haven't spotted yet and just continuing the pace at which we've been, which is somewhat of a challenge, no doubt, but I think we're gonna be in good shape. I do think the, the little gift of a, some time there at the end of August probably helps avoid anything getting left too rushed because we'll have a window there to wrap it up and then roll it out to teachers. So I don't see anything right now, but I say that was such a great sense of it could change in, you know, an hour is sort of how this has gone. So, but it seems like we're, we're doing well. I've been on a lot of the task forces and 
staff meetings and talking with the principals on um, the building level piece is taking off, which is exactly what we planned. Yeah, yeah, in terms of supplies, facilities, all that kind of stuff, everything. We're in good shape. In fact, we're gonna open the schools up earlier than we thought to the teachers because that'll help them to get in and start to strategize this new world that they have. Um, we hit one little snag with um, 90 M9 N95 masks for PPE and the fire department's taking care of that. So the little they you know I can't say there haven't been some but we kind of just step back and re-strategize it and this is the gift of such a collective effort like today I got an email Emerson's offered to help with whatever they can help with like the collective piece of this has been really important so that we're all we have resources to go to and not just trying to do it all by ourselves. So so far, we are navigating any little hiccups that have come along. Okay. Thanks. On that same same uh, line of thinking, Lori, are we uh, still awaiting any uh, outside contractor work on facilities? Uh, no. That, uh, no, in fact, and Russ is on, he's going to talk more when we get to the CPS stuff later. Uh, we really pulled back any work that we had planned this summer which was really smart because now we're not at anyone's um, timeline on those external kind of projects. So the only vendors that are coming in now are on an as needed basis at our discretion. Well, usually at the middle school, it's not always our discretion. It's because there's a little issue we need them to fix, but otherwise it's at our direction and discretion. So um, that had, if we had tried to do any projects of any kind, that would have created a much bigger issue. So I'm glad we didn't. Um, so thank you for asking that. And you're comfortable with uh, any uh, testing on uh, air exchange? Um, yeah, and, and Russ, Russ is on, so we could probably ask him. He's um, secured vendors for us. Russ, are you available there? Yep, uh, let me see. Just give them, I know, we didn't tell you we we're going to ask you about this part. Um, can you just give them the quick version of what you've secured for engineering, for HVAC, and uh, air testing? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we've hired a engineering firm, uh, BLW, just to come in and do an assessment of all of our HVAC equipment and just to ensure we're running at 100% uh, and just to offer up any recommendations um, they can do, uh, or we can do, as far as any uh, improvements. Um, we also reached out to uh, Mabbit Environmental, and we're hiring a, an industrial hygienist to come in and just to do like a, a risk assessment and just look at some of our uh, cleaning uh, processes and uh, some of our uh, chemicals that we're using to ensure they're uh, approved by the CDC. Um, they're also, uh, this industrial hygienist, they can do uh, swipe samples on high touch areas that they can test for uh, COVID-19. There is no test out there for air monitoring for COVID-19 we have to tell them or ask them uh, what we want test for, tested. So I should be meeting with them next week and they can give us some recommendations, so. All right, thank you. And we, know, we note that you're at Ripley right now. Yes, well, yeah. Thank, thank you to uh, your entire crew for their, yeah. their uh, extra, attention and uh, extra work this summer. Yep. Uh, thank you, Court. Yeah, we've, uh, you know, to Laurie's point, I'm glad we didn't take on any extra projects because this has freed me up to get the PPE and the tents and I'm going to be working very closely with this engineering firm and the industrial hygienist. So it would be hard to be running projects now and doing that. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So Lori, it's not really part of the plan, but um, especially the elementary schools with so many parents driving their children to school. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, 
the Concord Police Department. I know that the resource officers are, but that's that's a big big lift. Yeah. Yep. So the elementary principals, we're reaching out to them today, and pro and also uh, DPW is going to come in and be part of the conversation. There's already been some creative brainstormings. I was on the Alcott task force yesterday, and um, one of the veteran staff reminded us that there used to be a big, someone here will already know this, but it was news to me, that there used to be a big loop around Alcott, and could we reinvent some of that different approach rather than the way it's paved right now? So we're starting to strategize it. Um, certain settings are harder than others, for sure. Alcott and Thoreau, probably the top of the list, um, just given their they, you know, the settings they're in. So yes, we are definitely getting engaged in that conversation and um, working through that. And making people very alert to bikers and walkers. Yes. And yes. it's, it's going to be a little chaotic at first. Yes. Uh, there's no question about that. And so just to have everybody, you know, slow things down a bit. No, no need to rush to school. Correct. That is right. There won't, yeah, tardiness will have another definition than what it did before. <laughs> Great, thank you. We, we, will judge, we will judge their arrival by their intentions. Not yes, by the that's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's um, right. So I would just comment, I will also echo, and I won't keep saying, but I think given the, the myriad of factors and uh, how they're changing and the timing and everything, I think it is truly amazing actually the way this plan has come together and the fact that we have what feels like a multi-pronged plan that we can use as a guide and shift as we go using it is, is really impressive. So I just want to share my thanks to everyone who is involved. I know it was incredibly collaborative. Um, so huge kudos there. Um, the, my comment in, in question is somewhat has been in a way um, foreshadowed by a lot of these comments. The fact that there are still things that are not done and will be in the next level, as you said, mm -hmm. um, some details yet to flesh out. And as we approve this one, I think it'd be great for us to be able to communicate at some point kind of where those other things stand or when we will hear about them. Um, one I think about in particular in terms of timing is what the remote plan looks like for, for families who opt remote, not when everybody's remote, but right. for families who opt out of in-person, what that looks like, right. um, only that they need to know a little bit about what it looks like before they make the choice, possibly. So it's, I know that's a chicken and egg dilemma there. Um, and, and other things around, um, I know you've been, and so this is also to point out, I know there's work going on in all of this already. Mm -hmm. You, as you mentioned, talking about, um, scenarios with the headmasters and, and other school leaders and I know you're trying to get more feedback on thresholds that would then um, enable or inform other decisions you know the threshold for closing in one direction if we have to like ju just as likely or um, likewise thresholds for opening more right. um, fully at some point so right. All of those, and I know that those are things that you're looking for, and and that was a big part of our discussion yesterday process. with the health officials and all the Concord schools was yeah. to start working through that. And we did start to think we could at least put some scenarios out. You know, the more I listen, the more I understand why the it depends is really the answer. But I know that's not an easy answer for people to understand because it's very non-precise so um we were we were doing some of the hypotheticals or in case some cases some actual things that had happened in other local districts and or communities and you you start to see that we could probably put categories of things out um and maybe that would be helpful it's very hard to get to a, an exact number but that doesn't mean you couldn't put a number out and say this is where we would definitely be thinking about closing or something like that it would depend on the circumstance. Um, yeah. So we're working on it. That was a huge part of our conversation yesterday. And I uh, left, you know, and I spent a lot of time with my colleagues in the public districts around us too. And um, I did leave that, you know, one of our local private schools is bringing borders back. And I thought, well, at least I'm not responsible overnight. So um, we're all learning from each other. And we've had some nice emails since. And so I'm going to add that to my regular rotation of meetings. And but yes, the thresholds are a real big piece of communication for us to try to yeah. put something out to help people feel like there's some predictability. Right. To, and to in the meantime, 
it's just good for everybody to know that you are working on those things. Yeah. You know, here are the, here's the plan that we're voting on Monday. And here are the other things that, you know, are yet to come, but haven't been forgotten about. <laughs> right. Um, so just to get the, to the so. question on predictability. So for remote days, I think, uh, in grades six through 12 seem very clear in so far as it seems like you'll, for the most part, follow your existing schedule. Yes. Um, for the half days for the elementary schools, when do you think parents might have a firmer sense of what those afternoons will look like? So to Heather's point, things can start planning like childcare or I don't know, even I know there's a lot of talk in the community about tutoring and mm -hmm. cohorting small kids for tutoring, that kind of thing. So will, will the days be predictable? Yes, very much so. Um, I spent almost all morning on the elementary schedule, both the in-person and the remote afternoon. And we're really close to done. We're going to just need to share it out among the rest of the teaching staff and probably another week or so, I'd say. Oh, we're closing wow. in on it. Yeah. Right. It's going to be very, very predictable. So that, right. And the good news is we're building it so that it's likely to be predictable in the remote, full remote environment, too. So... That's been the goal, so one schedule and it, it holds across both settings. Um, all right, other questions or issues that people have or, or if not, not, you know, if you come up with anything else, you think of other things, again, make sure to reach out to one of us or Dr. Hunter before we come back Monday, ideally, because Monday we will hopefully take a vote on this. Yeah. And I think just important to say, you know, the vote you're taking is, yes, a vote of endorsement of what's there, but also a vote required by the state. It doesn't mean everything in that plan isn't going to be continually reviewed and um, effectively monitored and evaluated because that is absolutely best practice in this case. And some of that we won't know till we're in school and find the hot spots that need to be tweaked. So. And Lori, just for the record, uh, on the uh, 31st, is it a, a draft goes to the state? Um, so they, what I submit tomorrow um, is a very, really all, it's a very simple questionnaire that asks me to explain in-person, hybrid, and remote for all three it. levels. Mm -hmm. And then I have to send the full document. Um, the commissioners assured us that he's uh, prioritized his entire staff to be reading and reviewing. So we're glad to hear that and um, both the form and the full report in the next two weeks. Great, thank you. Lori, have you heard of any schools, uh, any districts that have prioritized uh, getting uh, students on campus full time or is everyone looking at hybrid? Everyone seems to have at least some hybrid going on. Um, Certain schools that accepted the three feet have had a little more, you know, it, 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 we, we were able to do it elementary. I've seen a couple districts that went with the three feet and have been able to do, do more with the upper grades. Um, but I haven't seen anyone who's fully open 100%. And my colleagues and I are surveying each other all day long, so <laughs> not yet. Thank you. Thank you. So we can, uh, unless there's anything else anybody wants to add, we can uh, adjourn the region. Seeing nothing, I'm going to take a uh, motion to adjourn the regional meeting. I moved. Second. Um, any discussion? We'll do a roll call. Um, <coughs> Wilson. Aye. Mustafi. Aye. Out. Aye. Booth. Aye. Rainey. Aye. Johnston, aye. It's all yours, Heather. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Heather and Sarah, you're welcome to stay, but welcome to <laughs> Um, okay, so on to CPS stuff. We have some capital discussions. Lori, I'll let you tee this up. Yeah, I'll, I'll open it. Russ is here to give us his um, feedback and input. We had uh, said and 
committed to the town of Concord that we would review this capital request as part of the rebuild of the budgets and the postponement of town meeting. So I'll just remind you what we had a what we had voted. Doesn't it feel like a lifetime ago when we voted all this? <laughs> voted in, I guess, the middle of the winter, uh, a plan to work within the town manager's allocation um, with a heavy focus on energy uh, replacement units at the element, Alcott and Thoreau specifically. We had also uh, referenced $50,000, that was 690,000, 50,000 for the integrated playground at Thoreau and um, 20 for increasing a boiler exhaust at Willard, uh, 40,000 for an AC chiller replacement also at Willard, and then the uh, standing 50,000 at each of the two middle school buildings. So the, the, I, think, I do think Town of Concord is uh, hoping we might revise this. Uh, we've had some high level conversation about that and I think asked ourselves some questions that uh, have led to Russ's engagement today. I can start with the easy ones and then we can make our way to the ones that probably need more discussion. The middle school, the two $50,000 slots for the middle school need to stay. So let's not, I hope you'll support that. Um, I do think the Thoreau Playground, we have funds available from other sources. So we can get started uh, without that 50,000. And I'll be honest to say that that's not the priority of the moment anyway. So um, it definitely is a need and a want, um, especially with those new programs over there. But we have, we have funds to start from PTG and such. So the 50,000 wouldn't um, make or break that getting going. Uh, and then I think uh, we had the boiler extension height of 20,000. I think we feel that can wait. And I know Russ wanted to just talk with you on the AC chiller at Willard and the ERUs. So those would be the two I'd say that are really up for review. I could, we could subtract 70,000 for those two projects, maintain 140 and then debate the 690 and Sorry, maintain 120 and debate the 690 and the 40,000. Did you follow mm -hmm. all that? Okay, so Russ, do you want to just yeah. talk on the boiler? No, the ERUs and the chiller. Yep, so the ERUs, I do, I know the last time we met, you know, I said this was something we could hold off, we don't need right away. Um, but it probably would be good if we could have the money for next spring. Um, with the lead time of equipment of these ERUs being 12 weeks, um, I would recommend that we go ahead and pursue that. Um, I don't I know when. Question, yeah. Yes, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Russ. I mean, I don't know if we don't do it now, when the next time would be um, that you'd have this opportunity and where we only have a window to do this project in the summertime, it would be nice if we could, you know, line this all up and plan and just order the equipment and just be able to execute this project next July. So, uh, Russ, I wonder if you might uh, uh, bring it down to uh, a less, less than technical level. Um, what does it uh, quantify what the benefits are and quantify what the costs are for postponing? Could you do so? Well, there is, there'll just be a lot of maintenance costs. These units are at the end of life. Uh, good example, just two weeks ago, we have the kids camp over there in the kindergarten wing now uh, using that and we lost a um, compressor for the air conditioning. So, you know, we had to have a company come in and repair the compressor and I haven't seen the invoice yet, but that's going to be a, a few thousand dollars that's going to hit our maintenance budget. Was that an ice up situation or a, uh, or a leak? A, it was a freon, uh, a freon leak. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had to find the leak, you know, repair it and then recharge it and 
So it's, and we can keep limping along like that too, if, if we have to. I know there's another unit there, another ERU, the wheel, it's missing mm. some of the fins or, so it's not running at, you know, 100% capacity. So if you were to take a, uh, a, a, a mere guess at uh, maintaining it for another year, were the town to be very inclined toward us doing that, what would you want to see in the budget? 150,000, um, knowing that it would be an unfortunate use of money, but necessary in order to defray doing it right? It's hard to put a number on it, Court, because um, those compressors are very uh, expensive. Like the other project we have at the Willard, I think we're, we're putting uh, 50,000 aside in capital. Um, for a compressor over there. So yeah, it would probably be a few hundred thousand in the maintenance budget. Uh, so in spite of uh, increasing austerity that we have to point toward, this seems like a responsible thing to do, unfortunately. I would say um, it would be. And it's also, there'll be an energy savings as well because these units were not originally designed, they were modified. Um, so now you're gonna get a, a unit that's designed with air conditioning and heat. And it'll be, uh, there's a, a payback on it. And a general question, are we in a competitive or non-competitive uh, climate for uh, capital purchases of the type? Any, any big changes uh, in the economy that are driving changes around these kinds of uh, 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 <coughs> project bidding? Uh, what, you mean like with contractors and yeah. Yeah. vendors? And um, I would say it's probably a little more competitive. Um, we've, we've gone out to bid once on these. Uh, we could go out again if needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, but no huge uh, drama in the industry. No, it's just, well, the only uh, critical path I, I think would be is the lead time on equipment. I'm just finding that because of the, the virus, it's really slowing down supply chains. Mm -hmm. So I just okay. feel comfortable if we could get this stuff ordered in, you know, February or March or, or not have to wait to go through another round of getting it approved. So, Chris, thank you for all those questions. I think it really helped to frame our discussion and thinking here. To me, it comes down to, is this a question of penny wise, penny wise pound foolish to put it off? Um, and I know last time we talked to us, I asked you, you know, it, does it seem like even though it would take an investment now it's more responsible fiscally to do this because of the fact that we could waste more money over the long term. And it seemed like probably yes to at least do some of them. I know you have more information now. So given all that you just told court kind of high level conclusion, does it feel like it would be, I guess, like court said, almost irresponsible not to do it because of the extra cost that could come later? or not yes. to put words in your mouth, or is it the opposite, you know? It's... I would say it would be prudent to go ahead and, and do this now versus just keep throwing maintenance money after this and putting band-aids on the, the units just to limp us along, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. It seemed like that's where it's going. Again, I don't wanna put yeah. words in your mouth. I just wanted yeah. to make sure that's what we're hearing. <laughs> yeah. And would you start, is this going to be Alcott first? Is it yes. Just, right. And is it, is it worse shape? Is it the correct term? The I believe they're older units, yes, at the Alcott, the, the original. I just have a memory that either Alcott or Anthero were not designed with air conditioning. And Neither was, of them were. Either. It was put in after the fact and there were numerous issues around it. Yeah. Yeah. So when I say the systems were modified, that's what I mean. Yeah. 
the air conditioning was added in after. Right. So, so. yep. Well, and for more context, we've been talking about replacing these ER ERUs for several years now. We've yep. done, and some of them might have gotten done, but it, so this yeah. it isn't the first time we've heard they need to be replaced and we've kicked the can down the road a little bit already. Yeah. I'm starting to get to that feel to that feeling. Yeah. That we better do something about it before it's a problem. Right. I think that uh, during the process the the price I assume you've built in some contingency that it might be less than six ninety or no, it's gonna be about that. Yeah, no, I I'd have to get with uh, Jared and Ian. I, I I don't know off the top of my head what the bids. Thanks. Oh. There is an economy of scale here. So the more we do, the less we'll spend. Is that generally true? Yes, that is correct. And it's it would make sense to do all of them, you know, just because of uh, it, I'm, this is going to be crane work. So mobilization fees and, and things like that. It, it would not be cost effective just to have it one replaced at a time or so. That was one of my questions initially was, could we just lower the number and stage it out more? But it fiscally doesn't really make sense to do right. that. So. so I'm a little confused. So we have a 690 and FY21, right? Mm -hmm. And then 680. So mm -hmm. is 690 both the row and Alcott? I think it's all. mostly Alcott. No. Yeah, I don't, we, the way that it's written there didn't break them out individually, but I think the goal is essentially to do Alcott and then essentially to do Thoreau. In FY22. Yeah, now, of course, we're about to enter 22, so because 21's running so late, we could, in theory, do both next year if we left the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but then you've got a problem getting the commitment before they've got to be ordered. Well, that's the FY22 problem, yes. I said in theory, yes. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, I know nobody wants to think about this, but <clears throat> we don't know that we're not going to have some issues around COVID next fall. It would be nice to get HVAC systems uh, you know, up to snuff just in case we still have issues. Um, I think if we had known this was coming, we would have argued that we should have gotten these fixed a while ago. So, um, I think it makes sense to, to move forward on it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if everybody is satisfied on this one. If so, um, tell us about the uh, AC chiller, if you'd be so kind, Russ. And so the AC chiller at the Willard School, there's two of them. And, and they're basically chiller, or I'd call them compressors too. Um, but two chillers handle the whole school. Right now we have lost uh, one chiller. It's just been deemed that it needs to be replaced. Um, so we basically do not have any redundancy there. If we lose the other chiller, um, it's going to, the building will be without air conditioning. And is the 40K for one chiller or two? For one chiller. So I think we could follow on Wally's comment of a minute ago and say, uh, we do need the redundancy as much now as we ever did. Uh, yeah. I would say uh, before our coffers are threatened further in the town, we do the responsible stewardship of these buildings and keep that number in here would be my sentiment. I would agree. Russ, is this a repair that can be done during the school year or no? Yes, this can be done during the school year. You know, after air conditioning season, it can, you know, this nice fall project or October, November, or early spring. Good. It would be good yeah. to place for the spring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So um, I, I missed this when we first started talking about this. Are we taking the boiler exhaust height increase off this or are we leaving it on? I was going to suggest you could take it off. 
but you can revisit that if you'd like. Um, it's, it's not feeling as urgent. It's been that way for Willard's entire life. It's a matter of having to make sure the door management happens and such so that the exhaust isn't going into the building. It's not an unsafe situation, but it's inconvenient for sure. You know, on, the, on that issue there, the wind has to be blowing just the right way. And it's, um, you know, some days it's a problem and some days it's not, so. Kind of design, design flaw that happened, yeah. Is it, does the door have to be open for it to come in? No, the, the issue there that the stack, the boiler stack or chimney or it's, it's too low, they didn't want to see it from the street. So it needs to be extended. Um, so I've had one company come out and take a look at it. And they were gonna do some uh, engineer, uh, do an engineer and estimate for me. Um, Can't just go up there and put a piece of pipe on. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like a lot of I wish. <laughs> Two feet. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because they got four boilers tied into this and two hot water heaters and it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was undersized where it shouldn't have been. So well, it, it's not an issue though. It's something if, if you have to hold off on something, I, I concur with Lori, that's probably something we can hold off on. If so it's been like this. So or, we keep it on our list of as soon as possible yeah. to add it back on next yeah. year. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good to keep on like a five-year plan or something, absolutely. Okay. That sounds like we're headed to reducing this by uh, $70,000. Yeah, so you don't, I didn't, we don't have a vote on the agenda. We can add that on Monday. Um, there is some convenience to all these meetings because we're never too far away from another one. Um, so I thought we'd start the discussion and then vote Monday as we like to do. So you're not deciding the same day. Yep. I agree. I think that makes sense. Yeah, no, it wasn't intending that we'd vote on it. But, um, if we were to uh, have to get this number down some more, mm. how would we do it? And Russ can pipe, I mean, really the only place you have to go is the ERUs. And I think then you, this would be a fiscal strategy more than the change of need that you would then want to look at what we put in for FY22 and how we approach that plan because the need is still there. So there, I, I think if you had to lower it, you'd end up with a three-year ERU project instead of a two-year ERU project most likely, which as we just said is maybe not as cost effective. And I'd like to hope we have reasonable odds of not expending the uh, the hundred k at the middle school, but something considerably less. Yeah, of course. Uh, because we've got a lot of uh, preventive maintenance attention happening uh, with Russ's crews at both buildings. Yep. So we might get lucky. Yep. I just want to make sure we've thought about that um, mm -hmm. before we get to town meeting. Yeah, yeah, good point. And I yeah. think also to be able to explain what the future cost is of doing that. If we cut it in half now, we as a town will be paying more as a result because of the fact that we lose the economies of scale. Yeah. We should have an idea before we get there of what those costs are, you know, presumably under some, let's say, slashed model. Russ, is the chiller one of those things that if you lose it, you can bring in a piece of equipment and attach and recreate the capability temporarily? Yep, that's a possibility. Uh, and it's, it's good too, because it's outside, it's on the loading dock. It's, that is a viable option if we had to do that. I could. Okay. We, Wally, uh, we, d we did that uh, at the Ripley School once when Steve Martin rented the Ripley School, true story, Russ, uh, rented the Ripley School, but uh, then refused to use it unless it was air conditioned. Oh. And uh, so we brought in a unit and parked it in the back. Yeah. yeah. So Steve Martin, wild and crazy guy? Yes. <laughs> Goldie Hawn as well. 
Of course. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this was a while ago. This House was a while ago. I think only husband. We're all extras in it. 30 years. <laughs> oh, dear. They left it here. <laughs> wow. I don't think we charged them enough either. Yeah. Uh, we don't seem to in the time. Can, when Hollywood shows up, it's like, oh, just, just, you can just use it. <laughs> All right. So does that give you the, as much as you need right now, Lori, really, it's a matter of tabling it until next week when we vote. But yes. Is everybody comfortable with where we are? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Then Russ, thank you so much for being right. here and that insight. It, it was Not anytime. Incredible. Have a great night, everyone. You too. You too. Right, Get your net AC on the way. Bye. Right. Right. Okay, so one more item, a discussion of one-to-one -one technology um, K5. So, Laurie, can you give us a little more update here? And we have Peter Kelly joining. Peter's here too. Hey, welcome. Yeah, Jared goes out of town. I just bring others with me. So. <laughs> right. Um, I referenced the other day that we were really studying our needs at K5 for technology. Um, in a normal time, we are well resourced and just getting, a, you know, working on the replacement cycle. Uh, this spring, as kids were working remotely, uh, we did essentially rely on families to have accessibility and we surveyed and made sure that those who didn't either had internet access or we uh, loaned them laptops. And Peter, how many laptops do you think we loaned K5? Boy, uh, 40, 50? I mean, we're, yeah, we that's about right, I think. Around, Over right? time, it happened gradually. Um, but in really looking at, you know, where we're going here, now that we've got a plan that includes half a day of remote and the potential to be fully remote again, um, and very clear messages coming from the state that devices should be part of this reopening plan. Um, we've been reviewing what we have in inventory. We've been considering the options and wanted to bring those to you. We, the good news, the good news is we do have money budgeted. Um, so assuming our budgets go forward as we've budgeted for them, and th these are in the draft budgets that you're reviewing even from this week. Um, uh, we've, we have 60,000 allocated at each elementary school. So we've been trying to use that as the, the marker and not, have to go into the COVID money and also strategize the, the choices in terms of are we trying, do we try to stay on the replacement cycle and make this part of the long-term plan? Are we in more of a, an emergency Band-Aid kind of mode? So we're, we're actually going to give you some of these options to look at. Um, and then we did price out just flat out buying all new machines for all students K-5, which We'll, you'll get a little sticker shock when I put the number up here in a minute. But uh, so Peter's here to talk through, I think, where we are at. I think we're mostly just wanting to keep you informed of the options. We don't really, we, we probably need a verbal blessing on the money since we're looking at spending from a budget that's not formally approved. I'm sort of saying this and thinking out loud as I say it because it's so strange not to have a budget at this time of the year. So let me show you where we are with options. And then Peter can, I think, take, take it from there. Peter, do you mind going through yeah. this I overview? It makes sense to drop down just the elementary one one proposal. Got to thank uh, Sue Howard and the instructional technologists at the elementary schools for going through our inventory. And with what we have there, you're looking at filling in two grade levels and making them one to one. You can see that there's four and five is listed there. And this is a general framework and kindergarten could make do with the iPads we have in the district. But we have that hole to backfill for the rest of the school, the students in the school. And it comes out to about 720 devices. So if you look back up at the numbers where we're, Lori slides that back up. I mean, these are the costs, right? So Per cost, if you go a little higher, Lori, um, on the top, there we go. When you're looking at Chromebooks, you're paying for everything needs $265 a unit. Um, that gets us well within our current budget lines uh, for the three elementary schools, if you wanted to make that change. If you took our current budget line annually and tried to buy the MacBook Air, as you can see, you're not gonna fill up. You've got 720 units versus 185 units, and that's not gonna make up the difference. 
Um, so when you look at it from that standpoint, uh, the choice seems pretty clear. We reached out to Apple on the finance side today, and we have financed with Apple before. Uh, and the numbers that came back today are, are pretty interesting. If you look at the four-year lease option that they sent, um, and it's 1.29 APR, that four-year lease option comes under our annual budget for the three elementary schools on the hardware line. And if you think in terms of you're making an upfront purchase of those units that if you bought them annually every year over the next four years, you would end up with maybe a handful more. Um, but this number that came today is, is interesting. It fits the budget. It keeps things um, intact as far as the program that we're running with Apple. Uh, we have the secondary piece, This, as Lori said, assuming the budget's approved, we can purchase for the middle school what we would normally purchase for them this year. The eighth grade, the rising eighth graders uh, who still have their laptops will get those back. Um, and the goal would be to put those down to the elementary school as many as possible. We're confident 180 plus or minus could get down there. And if we get that many out of the middle school to recycle down to the elementary, um, we can then take the iPads out of consideration. You can align grades three, four, and five with MacBook Airs, and then the lower level can either be, depending on the decision, they would be Chromebooks, or if you go with the lease route, which is the only way you'll make the Apple work is go with the lease route, um, then you get the whole school on the MacBook Airs. So there's really, I mean, there really are only two options to make this work quickly. The other consideration is, um, not just cost, but availability. We won't see a Chromebook until close to October. Um, everywhere we've talked to all the reps, they're saying you're not gonna see anything late September shipping, early October. If you did the Apple lease, you'd have them out of the warehouse in one to two weeks. So you would hit the ground running when school started and have equipment in hand. Otherwise you've got a delay. Mm. So I guess, let me just frame sort of where where the questions lie, I, and I, we can talk big picture technology plan. That's not what this was. That's not what this is, right? This is crisis mode. Um, we are not normally one to one K five by design because we don't we don't have kids on computers all day long, and they're not taking them home and all of that. Um, we've been trying to build a robust replacement plan. We've done that really effectively at middle and high school now, and this was the last stage when we're just getting accelerated on it because of the COVID crisis. Um, the question really is, and you know, Peter and I have very strong opinions about this and you hired us both knowing what they were, so I think we're okay to voice them. Um, you know, we're not Chromebook fans. We see a lot of districts do them because that's what they can afford. The Apples, Peter, how many years are we getting out of the Apple machines? We still have 2011, 2012s in service yeah. in the district. Yeah, so they're, they're serving us very well. Um, I actually thought like the lease option that you know is really the only Apple option that's available to us given cost. We, that's happened you know since two o'clock this afternoon essentially. So I really thought we were coming here to say you know sometimes you've got to do what you can and we'd have to consider Chromebooks. So it's interesting to be at a place where maybe that's not necessarily the case, um, and we're you know doing so well with the apples and what they can offer us. So. I think Another, to some extent we're looking for permission to consider going this direction with the one-to-one -one and then feedback on the device for sure. And you can also consider that in the elementary schools, they have our largest contingent of older laptops. They do. That, you know, part of the discussion Lori and I were working into this year was establishing what the program would look like for them actually going forward. If you did this one larger purchase on the lease, and we get back to normal and we're all back in school uh, full time. That is really sort of an upfront catch up purchase you could look at where we could retire some of those older devices out of the school and get back on track. And that would lead into potentially whatever decisions are made on the program for the elementary school that gets us caught up in a good place to launch from as well. Right. So the idea would be that after the this year where we're remote, you'd continue to obviously go on this four-year lease and those laptops would migrate back up to the six through 12 use. Uh, are you referring to the, the eighth grade ones that were gonna come down? No, like I'm saying, so if, if you lease 725 mm -hmm. MacBooks, or yes. 
And it's a four year lease. The idea is that you'd have one to one usage for K5 for this year. And so then in years two, three, and four, those MacBooks, where do they go? Well, I think one of the benefits of this would we've, as we discussed before, that we've been behind on our replacement cycle in the elementary yeah. school. This, in essence, would give us one big boost where we could catch up and eliminate some of the really old devices that should be retired. Right. Um, and at the end of those four years of this lease option, during that time frame, we'll figure out. I mean, Lori's going to guide us on what the best look for the elementary and technology is, but it allows us to catch up. Uh, very quickly. And at the end of those four years, we're in pretty good shape. We don't have that gap that we have right now that we're looking at. Yeah, it, it, it is. We do need a plan to get those old machines off line and that this would allow us to do that. You at all worried about like five-year-olds with a expensive device like that? Like, are we worried about them getting freaking trashed? Well, it, we, we buy Apple Care, and yeah, okay. to be sure we thought. I in my previous district, we did ask parents to buy insurance, and okay, uh, for that we haven't had that conversation Summer. here. Uh, we might yeah, if we're gonna hand it out. <laughs> All right, yeah. No, so it's these, valid, Alexa. <laughs> so these numbers are with Apple Care for three years. Yes, for three out of the four years, and are we assuming that we would expect every student to accept one of these? Do parents, families opt out and use their own devices? Uh, what, what happens there? So there's two ways to approach it. One, one is you can just put it out and ask the families who need the device if they want it and then let people use what they're using. Um, or do we prioritize it? And this is where I was leaning, which is why we've priced it the way we have. Or do we prioritize it that we get a lot of benefit from every, every student being on the same device? I know the technology specialists have a very strong opinion about that. Um, having now tried to support essentially a bring your own option for the last four months. Um, so the, you're right, those are the choices. You could probably lower this number if we made it a question of what's your level of need rather than everybody getting one. Yeah, Are well, we I, I, I think the, the efficiency argument with consistent use, uh, consistent machines is uh, yeah. inescapable. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It's hard to have a telephone conversation with a mom or a dad or a, ch a child about uh, making the device work if uh, right. we don't have a compatible device yes. in front of us at the same yes. time. Yes, yes. Lori, as much as I appreciate uh, the need here. I would like to see an iPad um, approach. I, I don't think the community can support this huge number, especially when we know 22, 23 fiscal years could be very brutal. And once you lock into a lease, we can't, we can't decide, no, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, I work in a district where we're one to one, just five, six, seven with iPads, and it's very successful um, with keyboards. And it's a, at least a third to a quarter of the price. And are they uh, a little more durable against uh, uh, lemonade and uh, drops? For the proper cases, so yes. For the proper cases, we have very rigorous uh, mm -hmm. cases. It would be a big, big uh, shift for us. I, I just, this number is, I don't think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that, more, is that uh, same lease option available for you? Yes. Yes, no, we could get uh, numbers on that as well. Do you how much would it change, do you think? Well, hard to say. She was trying to lower, my rep is trying to lower our pricing a little bit, but it won't be significant um, based on our volume. So I certainly get another quote and turn it down pretty quickly. That's the question. I mean, these, these are, I mean, the thing that's intriguing to me about this is we solve the immediate problem, but we end up in sort of the same replacement cycle we had planned. Is there a pedagogical difference between the airs and the, and the uh, iPads in our, in our estimation as a district? They're different, uh, with, yeah. 
Yes, yes. We we were definitely looking to be a um, a laptop oriented upper elementary program um, with iPads at the lower elementary. Um, and the more tools that we've been bringing, that's been the mindset. Um, you know, when I look at the the software we've just secured for this coming year, I. I do think it would have impact. Cynthia's right, I'm sure we could make things work, but we had gone into things expecting laptops. But you know, we've thrown Chromebooks on the table here today too. So we're, we're in this, what do you do immediately versus the long term and do you try to meet both needs at once or not? I guess that's part of the, part of the strategy. Well, speak a little more about that, uh, Laurie or, and Peter. Uh, the, the user experience is different, uh, but if the actual interface is all web-based, uh, mm -hmm. does the mm -hmm. iPad drop out any functional utility of specific software applications? Well, th certainly there are different yeah. software packages. We'd have to look right. at uh, the curriculum side and what's ordered, and you know, a compatible if if they've got a compatible iP um, iOS software for it. Um, so that requires us going back to look at that. As Laurie said, a lot of decisions, a lot of the software we looked at were being expected to be run on laptops. Yeah, okay. So we, so that question remains open. What would we uh, either put in jeopardy or, or force out, squeeze out of the, uh, the plans uh, if we were to go to iPads at a given grade level? Yeah, I think technology has become very much more, as it should be, a, a curriculum question as opposed to just a hardware question like it may have been when we first started rolling out hardware into the buildings. And as curriculum's been integrated, Laura can certainly speak to it. Um, then you start to make decisions that uh, the device does impact. So as we've talked about, um, in terms of platforms, three to five will be on Google Classroom, but K2 will be on Seesaw. So I guess the first question would be that if we were to look at iPads K2, does it affect the use, usage and user experience in Seesaw? And then to Court's point, what else does it affect, right? I mean, I think I'm just putting these on our list of questions that we would need to look into. I think, I think that's a very necessary piece of homework. Uh, right. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. <laughs> uh, <of> <laughs> Everything's kind of real time at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Can what I, about the strategy of having the fifth graders on um, MacBook Airs to ease the transition to sixth grade? Because I'd like to see either fifth and sixth on that, you know what I'm saying? Because you have that big transition year. So, you know, we try to have a, in our school, so the fifth and sixth graders are on the same platform and then we move them up as they get into the older years of middle school. So I think having a consistent device in fifth and sixth grade would be helpful in that transition so um so that's a that's an option you know we use ipads but i can see having um fifth graders have the same device as they're going to get in sixth grade might be helpful um yeah we do have the current inventory in the buildings and the laptop carts so that right now you could have fourth and fifth grade on those existing laptops so you're looking to backfill below that with um what you need. Okay. Um, can I back up to the some of the numbers again for a minute? Initially, it was Chromebooks versus MacBooks. And so now I guess it's comparing the three of them to some extent. But with the information that we have, the Chromebooks, that budget number of 190,000 is a one time. If we look at the lease, the 175 a year fits into our budget. Um, but we're paying it four times, right? Right. Correct. So we are paying more overall. So I guess, and I'm just kind of laying this out for a comparison point. Um, the downside is we're paying more all, more overall. The upside is we end up with technology, or we end up with hardware that fits into our pedagogical strategy already, as well as things to start to feed into that replacement cycle, right? So to, to help us with that catch up. Right. So if we went for, the high, I'm not gonna say MacBooks versus Chromebooks, so MacBooks versus either Chromebooks or Chromebooks or iPads. It, you're somewhat, you're um, balancing those by the fact that you're feeding into your 
future replacement cycle. And so for those, let's say years three and four, future years when you're paying, when you maybe wouldn't have been for Chromebooks, is it fair to say we're not paying completely incremental there because it's something we would have had to put into other devices anyway, and now these devices are becoming the catch-up ones? So I guess I'm trying to define, are years two through four actually incremental, or are they just money that we would spend anyway, and we're spending it in a different way? Well, I yes. think that makes sense, right? Assuming you've got the same budget lines for hardware in the elementary schools, you're going to spend that annually on new hardware. Um, that line covers both staff and students going forward. Uh, so if that line stays the same, then yeah, you've, you've gotten the asset in year one. You're paying year two, three, and four for that asset, but you'd have purchased new assets in year two, three, and four regardless. Okay. So basically, to some extent, we're uh, purchasing now what we maybe would have purchased in years three or four, but we're getting it now to use with the younger kids. Correct. And, you know, I mean, I hear it, it would be interesting to see what the iPads look like, but I, and I hear Cynthia's concern. I don't know that hardware is the place to try to save money in the event things are so bad we're looking you know we would have wished we hadn't spent an extra 50 or 60 grand a year you know this is a pretty integral part of the program delivery um and i think if we as a district have made the choice that uh that airs are better than uh than ipads or work better for what we're trying to do i would hate to see us uh, I don't think we should impose a pedagogical decision on the district because we're, we're anticipating a budget shortfall over the next two or three years. Um, that's going to be probably a, you know, not a significant difference between iPads and, uh, and MacBook Airs. So I think you'd have to, I would, I would want to look somewhere else for the savings. Well, I respectfully disagree with you, Wally. So let's get the numbers. Let's take a look. Um, I do think that uh, if I had to, uh, 175,000 is, is a teacher plus. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just afraid of 22 and 23 looking very bleak, especially what we just heard today about the economic conditions in our country. So, um, I would just like to try to be as cautious and conservative as we can everywhere that we can be. Um, and I don't think there's a significant pedagogical loss with an with a, um, iPad. My question though would be, so now you'll have 720 iPads that then can't, or maybe they can, but are not the same technology that the upper grades who already have the one-to-one -one technology have. So then we would essentially, if we are not doing remote learning in the future, we would have an excess of 720 iPads that don't really have a place to live or, or be utilized. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I think those are the questions we probably need to go back. And I mean, this is literally, we got the lease information at two o'clock. So we've had zero, I mean, literally I'm doing this five minutes before the meeting because Peter texted me the information. So we haven't had time to have any internal dialogue. And I think the iPads is a fair question to put on the discussion table. So let us take between now and Monday and uh, get you another round of information so we can talk through all of the options. I mean, I, Alexa, they wouldn't go to waste. They certainly wouldn't. Um, it may shift, may shift a little of what we were strategizing. Is it a big shift? I can't say without a little bit of time to, to talk about it. And Lord, uh, I hope that the, the conversation includes uh, the question of, of why parents who could opt for a Mac Air uh, end up uh, providing their younger children with, with iPads instead. Uh, and I would hope we could hear from some of the uh, uh, early elementary folks and uh, the, the K, K through two folks in this regard. But I think a critical question is the one you brought up already. If we are reliant on Seesaw, if we already know that, then how does that perform on the iPad? That's uh, 
to me, a basic question. We used iPads all through remote learning and used Seesaw anecdotally. I can say it worked great. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would expect it would. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't have concerns about Seesaw uh, on the other devices. Sure. Well, that's good news. That, then that means it is a viable option that we've got to look very carefully at. Okay. So, so I guess I'll just preface all the work we're going to do by saying, you know, we aren't going to have time to build you what we would wish we could have, which was some master technology plan and all the pedagogy that goes with it on all of that. We'll do what we can in a couple of days to bring you solid information for what, where we're at. <laughs> so Peter and Lori, uh, would it be accurate to say that your, your objective for next year is to make the shifting sands of where a child is going to be on a given day or a month uh, at least uh, seamless on the technology side if if it's not uh, seamless in terms of uh, wh where they park themselves uh, in the morning yeah and seamless for families because it's become clear we've just sent out a plan that includes remote learning for all kids at the same time and I think we have to be part of the solution to that. So making sure the accessibility doesn't become a family issue. You know, one thing that didn't get said, or I, I missed it, so my, my apologies, the, the lease here is lease, not lease to purchase. It is lease to purchase court. Okay, good. Yep. All right, so we ought, to call that, we ought to call that out specifically when, yep. uh, yeah. When when we make this known to the public, whatever we're going to do, it's a one dollar purchase option at the end of the finance period. <coughs> Traditional, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's seven hundred twenty-five dollars. You could say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna lighten it up a little. Great. So so Lori, some, some maybe some back of the. I mean, quick math on K three iPads versus four or five MacBook Airs or something. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll get Apple to give us numbers on the iPads and we'll play around with the allocation to different grade levels and make a suggestion to you as to what technology fits best where and mm -hmm. revisit it on Monday. Sounds good. Thank you so much. No, good suggestion to do the homework. You feel like you have what you need from us in terms of guidance on what to collect and questions. That I do. I just want to, you know, just make sure your expectations are in line with the fact it's Thursday and that's coming Monday. <laughs> we'll do our best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, time is critical here too. So it is, it is, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I, uh, I think we need to be careful as a committee to, um, you know, not create a problem getting things in the hands of the people that need them for school opening. It's just a large amount of money. So I think we need to do a little I understand, bit. but I also. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, were you planning on being in tomorrow? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> if, if not, we just changed it for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, I'll have my Apple rep on the phone after we get off the meeting here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right on it. Well, thanks to you and your team for, uh, for being uh, what in a big hurry to work this out, but being patient with the school committee. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate no, your time. That was, a good, that was a great dialogue. I mean, we're doing this quick and we should do it thoughtfully and quickly at the same time. At the same time. A little hurry up and wait and hurry up again. Yeah. That's your bumper sticker. And the benefit of meeting twice a week is that it can roll a meeting and not have Great no, 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 we're not going to. I know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I was meeting you, Wally, uh, so you would have uh, respond about meeting twice. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even get the agendas done in time. Uh, no, right, yeah. All right, thank you. That's a good discussion. Okay. Peter, thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. Um, and everybody else, unless, is there anything else before we adjourn? No, that's it for today. Okay, then I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Second, Cynthia. You said, thank you. Then by roll call, uh, Rainey. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Booth. Aye. And about aye. Thank you all. We'll see thank you, you shortly on Monday. <laughs> bye. Bye. You don't want to meet over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye.